Uh, okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, contrary to many people, I feel almost at home in Czechia, and I will ser I will uh, uh, help the room hosts in spelling my in pronouncing my name. So my name is Andrzej Pietrasiewicz, and today I will tell you about stateless encoding in video for Linux. Given how symmetric Maxwell equations are. In 1971, a guy called Leon Schwa postulated the existence of the fourth companion to the already known passive electronic components. The device is called a memristor and it changes its resistance depending on how much current has flown through it and as such it can be used to build memories. 2023 is the 1971 of video codecs in Linux because stateless encoders are coming to Linux. And I know what I'm talking about because I've been de dealing with one. And by the end of this talk, you will understand the difference between stateful and stateless, and you will be able to use uh, stateless encoders. But before we get there, we need to talk about what stateful and stateless is, uh, and then we will talk about the user space API you need to use to control stateless encoders. And that is the part when I will be showing you links to the kernel and gstreamer trees. We will talk about rate control, why it is important and why you want it applied when encoding. And we will out outline possible future directions for encoders. And in about 30 minutes from now, we will be finishing with a questions and answers session. So let us now talk about the difference between stateful and stateless uh, codecs. But first, let's make it clear what codecs are. A codec uh, is, a, is either a program or a, uh, or a hardware device which is used to encode or decode a data stream or a signal. And this talk is about uh, hardware codecs which are often found in systems on a chip. In very general meaning, a codec is also a specification and modern codecs usually only specify what constitutes a valid bitstream and how to decode it, while they say little to nothing about uh, encoding or how to come up with a, a valid bitstream. This information will be important later. In video for Linux, uh, codecs are represented as memory to memory devices, and to understand what it means, we need to peek into ancient history of video for Linux. So some 30 years ago, a predominant use case was a, an analog TV grabber card where the user connected the antenna to the card and the card received TV signal and presented, uh, uh, received video frames uh, to, to the computer. And these devices were called uh, capture devices because they were used to capture data from the hardware to the computer memory. Of course, there, there also existed uh, devices which were doing the converse. That is, given frames in computer memory, they were generating a signal suitable for broadcasting. And those were called output devices because they were used to output data from the computer to the outside world. In, uh, and when the hardware codecs became popular, uh, they were modeled as both uh, output and capture devices. So the output part is for uh, transferring uh, data to the hardware, raw frames in case of encoders. And the capture part is for transferring the processed data from the hardware to the computer memory. and. These are encoded frames or bitstream in case of encoders. And such a device is a memory to memory device. And this talk is about stateless encoders of this kind. So obviously you now want to know what stateless codecs are. In state full codecs, the current state of encoding or decoding is kept and maintained in the hardware. Whereas in state less, Codecs, the current state of encoding or decoding is kept and maintained outside the hardware. This seemingly innocent distinction does have consequences. 
Let's, for example, look at reference frames, which are an important part of uh, encoding or decoding state. So in virtually all modern codecs, the compression is achieved uh, in part by applying a transform to move from color domain to frequency domain and then quantizing the transform coefficients. But instead of transforming and quantizing the frame contents directly, a difference between a frame and its prediction uh, is transformed and quantized and this results in better data compression. And that's possible because uh, both the encoder and decoder uh, generate exactly the same uh, predictions. And the final stage is entropy coding, where uh, more frequent uh, data is assigned shorter code words, while less frequent data is assigned longer code words. In video codecs, there are two strategies to predict the context, contents of the next portion of data either to refer to an already processed part of the current frame or to refer to, an, to some other already processed frame. The first is called intra-prediction, and when it is applied, uh, such a frame can be decoded without uh, referencing any other frames. So such a frame is a self-contained frame, sometimes called a keyframe. Um, the second strategy is called inter-prediction, and when it is applied, reference frames are needed to decode such a frame, and reference frames can depend on other frames, so this can generate quite a complicated set of dependencies. Now let's think about what happens when one wants to uh, switch from encoding one sequence to encoding another sequence in a state full encoder. So when, uh, the new frame, when the new sequence starts being processed, the old context is gone. So when you want to resume encoding the first sequence, the original context is not there. So you must restart from the last uh, self-contained frame, keep uh, encoding until you hit the frame where you left off, and keep discarding the resulting bit stream because these frames have already been encoded and you are only interested in the side effect of recreating the context. And once you recreate enough of the context, you can uh, resume appending to the bit stream. This looks like a lot of effort. In comparison, in state less encoders, the state is kept and maintained outside the hardware, so uh, switching the context uh, is a matter of swapping several pointers. So now that you have a better idea of state full versus stateless, let's summarize the differences. So the hardware is more complex in state full codecs, and so it is also more expensive. And it is less complex in state full codecs, so it is cheaper. In state full codecs, uh, the mm, dynamics in the software is bigger because you need to interact with codec with your codec firmware and such codecs such stateful codecs are often uh, implemented as dedicated systems running their own internal firmware and interacting with that fir firmware you know keeping up with the state of that firmware is a considerable effort on the other hand in stateless encoders uh, have much more regi hardware registers to uh, to cope with and in stateless encoders, switching a context, and by switching a context, I mean moving from one sequence to another sequence, is less expensive than in stateful uh, codecs. And so uh, stateless codecs also offer more flexibility because uh, various strategies, such as uh, reference frame selection or rate control, can be you know, changed, whereas in stateful, Codecs. This is all hard coded in in the hardware. This, no, this does not necessarily mean that state full codecs are bad. Uh, sometimes the trade offs might be in their favor. For example, when you don't need to switch between sequences and increased price of the hardware is not a problem. That said, hardware vendors tend to provide uh, stateless 
solutions nowadays. So let us recap what we have been talking about until now. We know what codecs are. We are talking about uh, stateless hardware encoders, and we, don't, we know the difference between stateful and stateless. So now let us talk about uh, how to use stateless encoders, VP8 in particular. In 2020, Paul Kociałkowski published H.264 stateless encoding support. I tried that code this year and it works. Uh, he, he also had a pretty detailed uh, talk about it at one of the ELC editions. Earlier this year, I published an RFC patch series, which adds stateless VP8 encoding support. And Benjamin Grignard uh, published a GStreamer merge request, a corresponding GStreamer merge request. And these two seem enough of a critical mass to start bringing sta uh, stateless encoding support to the kernel. I ran Paul's code and I developed my code using a uh, Huntro derivative, which is found in uh, rock chip, chip RK3399. And both these encoders uh, use request API. So let's first understand what requests are in the context of video for Linux. Let's think for a while about an old style output device, which receives frames from computer memory and generates signals suitable for broadcasting. Let's suppose there is some control in the device, not necessarily a physical knob, but some hardware setting controllable from the software. The control is maybe for changing the brightness or saturation or contrast in the generated signal. If frames A and B, for example, have been emitted and you want to change uh, this setting from frame C on, the control needs to be changed. But think of what happens if uh, we want this control applied for each frame separately. Then you need to wait until the previous frame completes, but before the next one starts, uh, then you need to apply the setting and not change this setting until the next frame. And this is exactly the problem that uh, requests in Video for Linux solve. They offer you a framework to apply control settings for each frame separately and not have to worry about the above mentioned timing issues. The fundamental concept in that framework is a request object, which is created per each frame and uh, needs to be queued instead of your frame. And the framework takes care of all the rest. In video codecs, requests are useful for uh, associating uh, an output buffer. And you already know what output means in, in V4L. So they are useful for associating an output buffer with a set controls to be applied when processing this particular frame. And in stateless codecs, there's a lot of parameters to be associated with a frame. So now that you know about request API, let's see how it is used. This slide might look complicated, but we will go through it step by step. The parts in green refer to the requests directly. So the first IOCTL is used to allocate a request object whose file descriptor is returned in the third parameter. Then the usual V4L2 stuff follows. Extended controls in V4L is a bit like a descriptor of the actual controls array, which in this case contains a single element. We need to instantiate a VP8 encode param struct, uh, which will hold VP8 specific parameters and will be associated with the controls array. For clarity, I omit memset to zero, which you often want to use before you use these structs. And I omit IOCTL return values, which in real life you need to inspect and handle. We associate our ext controls uh, with uh, the encode param struct. And we declare that there is a single uh, element. We tell uh, the framework that uh, it is a control ID stateless VP8 and code params. We pass the pointer and size the usual V4L2 way. And now comes the request API specific part where we 
declared, declared to the X control struct that we want the control applied to a request and we pass the request file descriptor and then um, proceeds as usual with a usual IOCTL. But at this moment, this uh, control has been applied to the request and then we need to um, enqueue the request, which is which happens in the last IOCTL. And that's all there is to the VP8 specific part, except read control, but we will get to that later. For the curious, uh, this is how the VP8 encode struct looks like. On the one hand, this maybe looks large, but on the other, compared to other modern codecs such as uh, AV1 or VP9, just 14 members is, is relatively little. If you know the VP8 spec, the names will look familiar to, to you, and if you don't, then be informed that these have direct counterparts in the spec. Of course, uh, these cannot be set to whatever you like. There needs to be some strategy, and you remember that the spec says nothing about how to build a valid bitstream. It only says what a valid bitstream looks like. In the codec we are talking about, the GStreamer element uh, published by Benjamin, uh, we take a very straightforward approach. So if you want you know, some more clever strategy to, to be applied when uh, generating this VP8 bitstream, then uh, you have an opportunity to get involved in GStreamer development. So let us recap what we have been talking about until now. We know what codecs are. We are talking about stateless hardware encoders. We know the difference between stateful and stateless. We know how to use request API with stateless encoders. And let us now talk about rate control. Rate control is a general process you want applied when encoding regardless of a particular codec type. Let's see what it is, why it is important, and why you want it applied. Given the nature of video encoding, the sizes of each uh, encoded frame may vary and are generally unknown upfront. The general rule being that the intra-coded frames tend to occupy more space than inter-coded frames. And rate, co rate control has to do with how much space each encoded uh, frame occupies. From the point of view of a decoder, as long as you don't want to alter the bitstream, there's no rate control. Depending on the width of your communication channel, be it an internet connection or your physical interface to your local storage device, it will take each frame a different amount of time to travel from source to destination. Maybe you want to apply some buffering at the receiving end. And as long as there's enough bandwidth, you will be able to present the, frame, the frames live with the desired FPS rate. This is very different while encoding, because it is the moment uh, when each, the size of each encoded frame can be influenced. And rate control is about influencing the sizes of encoded frames so that at a desired FPS rate, the resulting bitstream is within desired limits. Different strategies can be applied for different trade-offs. For example, constant quantization parameter. In this strategy, each frame is quantized using the same QP value. So constant quantization parameter implies maintaining the same QP for each frame at the expense of varying bitrate. On the other hand, constant bitrate strategy uh, assumes that frames transmitted at a fixed FPS rate generate a constant stream of data. So constant bitrate implies maintaining bitrate at the expense of varying frame quality. Average bitrate uh, means maintaining average bitrate over a period of, of time at a desired level, and there are, there are certainly other uh, options possible. The VP8 RFC allows per frame constant QP, which means that the quantization parameter is maintained for entire frame, but can be different for different frames. And let's have a look at using it. To specify a per frame uh, uh, constant QP, 
request API is used. So in fact, the QP should be applied to the same requests VP8 encode params have been applied to. And the usual procedure applies. We build X controls structs, which points to the actual array of controls. In this case, this array contains a single element. We specify the control ID and its value. This time, there's no need to pass a pointer in size because it is a simple numerical numeric control. And at the end, we associate uh, the X controls with our request and then call the IOCTL the usual way. In the GStreamer element uh, published by Benjamin, there is a very simple algorithm implemented, which looks like the P part from a PID algorithm. And by PID, I mean the classical uh, control theory algorithm. So the, the P is for proportional, and this very simple uh, implementation uh, does only the following. So when the bitrate becomes too large, uh, we quantize more aggressively, and when the bitrate becomes less than the limits, we quantize less aggressively. So again, there's another opportunity for you guys to step in and help with GStreamer development and maybe offer PID or maybe some other clever uh, algorithm for rate control. Okay, so let us recap again what we have been talking about. We know what codecs are. We are talking about stateless hardware encoders. We know the difference between stateful and stateless. We know how to use request API with stateless encoders. We know what rate control is and how we can apply per frame constant QP. So let us now talk about possible future directions for stateless encoders in Linux. You might say that VP, today VP8 is already an old codec, and indeed it is. And this reason alone makes it rather unlikely that new VP8 encoding hardware ever appears. Actually, to the best of my knowledge, Google had been given, giving away a design of a VP8 IP block for free. So there is little incentive for people to reinvent the wheel. Uh, because designing an IP block takes a lot of skill and resources. That said, VP8 is lingua franca in video conferencing, because if everything else fails, then VP8 it is. So it is still relevant today, and it is simple, uh, so it makes sense to start adding stateless encoding support with it. You guys are lucky, because I'm bringing to you the very latest developments uh, from the Media Summit we had only this Monday. Uh, so in the Linux kernel, there is this two drivers rule, which means that you cannot upstream a new UAPI if, unless you have at least two driver users of that API. But given what you have just heard, we are in trouble because quite likely there's only one kind of VP8 encoding hardware. So what do we do? Uh, so the conclusion is that if we can reasonably make sure that indeed there is only one kind of VP8 encoding hardware available, then the two drivers rule will become a one driver rule. Uh, but guys, if you can help me uh, making sure that it is true indeed, or if you are able to prove me wrong, then your help would be greatly appreciated. Another takeaway from the Media Summit is that uh, the UAPI should support three reference frames. For now, it supports just one, and that is because the hardware we are using uh, handles only one. Uh, actually, it should be a po possible, it should be able to handle two, but we don't know yet how. But anyway, the UAPI should allow you know, the, the full set. Th these. Uh, uh, one more, one more takeaway, uh, still VP8 related, is uh, where the frame header should be generated. So it seems we are okay with generating this frame header in the kernel, and there are two reasons for that. So one reason is that VP8 in VP8 there is this notion of probabilities, which are adaptively uh, updated after each frame, and they need to be uh, put in the frame header so that the decoder can read them. 
and these uh, probabilities are updated using uh, by reading uh, hardware counters. So the encoding hardware features some hardware counters which uh, accumulate how many times a given symbol has occurred in the bitstream. And because these are hardware counters, uh, the kernel seems a natural place to access some hardware, right? And the other reason for assembling the frame header in the kernel is that these probabilities tend to be a quite large set of data. So if we wanted to assemble the frame header in user space, then we would have to you know, come up with some dedicated control and pass this large set of data uh, to user space. So all in all, it seems it makes sense to uh, generate the frame header in, in the kernel. So these three were VP8 specific, and now the rate control conclusion from the Media Summit is not specific to any codec. Uh, so the per frame constant QP uh, is okay, and it seems we, we want it. But if we assumed uh, that it's only user space that is uh, uh, allowed to do rate control, then uh, we would end up uh, being unable to use certain hardware that does have some support for hardware assisted rate control. Right. So maybe, maybe we want uh, some, uh, we want an option for drivers, for individual drivers, you know, to, to override whatever the user wants and, uh, and uh, use their, their hardware capabilities to actually do rate control. And maybe, maybe, that's not, uh, that's not quite clear yet, maybe we also want uh, an in-kernel in algorithm for all encoders to use, but that's subject to an RFC, and when an RFC, actual RFC appears, a discussion can follow whether we want it or not. In 2023, it would not be possible to not talk about AI. So a natural place to look for AI assistance in Codex is to improve encoders, for example, by using AI to select reference frames or to do rate control or both. But another option is uh, possible, maybe. Uh, so there is this experiment with text-to-speech synthesis. Uh, which means audio signal, but I see no reason why it cannot be applied to video signal as well. And this, in, in this text-to-speech synthesis experiment, uh, they are doing a clever thing. So one would think that uh, the natural way to do text-to-speech would be to have the waveforms generated in the first place, maybe with some AI help, to have nice, uh, you know, pauses, uh, good prosody, nice intonation, and so on and so forth, and then apply well-known compression techniques. But what they are doing is much more bold. Uh, so based on the original text, they try predicting with AI what the encoded bitstream will look like, completely bypassing the uh, waveform stage. So maybe, maybe the same concept can be applied for video encoding, who knows? So let us re recap what we have been talking about until now. We know what codecs are. We have been talking about stateless hardware encoders. We know the difference between stateful and stateless. We know how to use request API with stateless encoders. We know what rate control is and how we can apply per frame constant QP. And we have seen possible future directions for stateless encoders. This concludes my presentation, and your takeaway is that stateless encoders, encoders are coming to Linux. Uh, thank you for your attention, and are there any questions? Thank you very much. We are right on time. If you have questions, please raise your hand. Um, thanks for the talk. 
What about H.264 and H.265 encoding? How does that look? Uh, so for H.264, uh, Paul published his uh, series, his part series and his user space program in 2020. And to the best of my knowledge, he, he would be willing to continue with that, but is out of resources for that. But anyone can pick up and continue. Uh, for H.265, I don't know, but we need to start with something, and VP8 seems uh, easy, uh, low-hanging fruit for, for a start. And there is no stateless encoders support in Linux whatsoever at this moment. So. Um, yeah, just an observation, really. Uh, you're the first speaker today who hasn't mentioned Rust. <laughs> Uh, yes, but once Daniel, uh, who is in the front row, uh, you know, succeeds in uh, uh, in improving V4L2 support in Rust, you will be able to write your driver, the new driver in Rust. Hey, uh, so I'm Paul. Just wanted to follow up on the H264 question. Um, so indeed, on the hand row rock chip side, um, we just have this kind of proof of concept that you link to. Uh, but I'm actually now working on H.264 encoding for the Cydrus uh, driver, which is the all winner encoder. Uh, so it's working as of last week. Um, and I'm also working on the UAPI stuff. So it's definitely also coming for H.264. Um, H.265, as far as I know, no one is uh, really looking into it at the moment. But there's hardware, there's stateless, stateless hardware around. So it should come around at some point. And also, I wanted to comment on the VP8 uh, double driver thing. Uh, it looks like the Cydrus encoder is also, well, the Alwiner uh, video engine encoder is also able to do VP8. So it, it's uh, the same block that is used for H.264. So it might be uh, the second driver that you're looking for if someone has time to kind of look into that. So. Uh, but do you think it's truly a different piece of hardware or it's the same IP block? packaged in a different chip and maybe with a different register layout. So for, for, from what I can see, they're using the same blocks from the H.264 encoder mm -hmm. because VP8 and H.264 share some concepts and everything. So to me, it's more like they design their own and it supports both codecs. So it's not like the Google one that they retrofitted because it, it really looks like it's using the same internal stuff. And okay. I know that the H.264 encoder is definitely not the hand one. So it oh. might be uh, an, an actual uh, different implementation. Okay, talk to you later. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Any more questions? We don't have any questions from the virtual audience. In that case, thank you very much. Thank you for the great talk. And with that, goodbye. Thank you.